we have um, a renowned guest speaker here with us, Dr. Brian Alexander, who's going to be talking about technology futures. I'm sure you guys will be interested in hear what he has to say. And we have representatives from Microsoft and Apple here as well. Uh, Google was supposed to be here. Um, they're not here. So we're going to have um, Russell Boschman talk a little bit about some cool technology stuff that he has, that he's going to, um, that he's going to display for us. So we'll talk a little bit about the agenda. So from, so we're going to have um, Dr. Alexander speak first, and then <clears throat> Microsoft, then um, Russ, Russell, Russell will speak. Uh, we have lunch in Upper Commons. We do have some lunch vouchers. So when you, when you leave here for lunch around 12, we, we give you a voucher. You can go up to the Upper Commons um, and, and, and eat and then come back on us. Um, let me see. So I'd like to introduce our co-sponsors. Uh, that is Rush Boschman, uh, Institutional Support, Instructional support. Instructional support Director, as well as Director of Cybersecurity, um, Doug White, as well. And I'd like them to feel free to say some words if they like to. No, thank, thank you all for coming. This is a pretty exciting time. Um, and I'm glad to be part of this. Doug? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for coming. So, with that being said, um, Russ, you want to introduce our guest speaker? Thank you. Oop, there we go. So thank you all for coming. I should feel like, oh. Um, let me put this up here. So I'm here to introduce, hi, Sean Hi, Linda. Uh, I'm here to introduce uh, Dr. Brian Alexander, uh, who I actually met through uh, Linda Beeth at one of the conferences we went to. And, I was immediately uh, taken aback and, and drawn into to his amazing mind and how it works uh, as it relates to technology and, and, sci and science and science fiction. Um, Dr. Alexander is an internationally known futurist, researcher, writer, and speaker, uh, consultant and teacher as well, working in the field of how technology transforms education. He completed his English language and literature PhD at the University of Michigan in 1997 with a dissertation on doppelgangers, my favorite word, uh, in romantic era fiction and poetry. Uh, Brian taught literature, writing, multimedia, and information technology uh, at Centenary College of, of Louisiana, Centenary. Uh, there he also pioneered multi-campus interdisciplinary classes while organizing an information literacy initiative. From 2002 to 2014, Brian worked with the National Institute for Technology in Liberal Education, uh, Knightley, uh, a nonprofit working to help small colleges and universities best integrate digital technologies. With Knightley, he held several roles, including co-director of a regional education and technology center, director of emerging technologies, and senior fellow. Over those years, Brian helped develop and support the nonprofit group here uh, peer networks, consulted, and conducted a sustained research agenda. In 2013, Brian launched a business, Brian Alexander, LLC. Through BAC, he consults through higher education in the United States and abroad. Brian also speaks widely and publishes frequently with articles appearing in venues including the Atlantic Monthly, Inside Higher Ed, um, and so on. He has been interviewed by and featured in MSNBC, US News and World Report, National Public Radio, The Chronicle of Higher Ed, um, Pew Research, Campus Tech, and Connected Learning Alliance. He is currently writing uh, Transforming the University in the 21st Century, The Next Generation of Higher Education for Johns Hopkins University Press. Uh, his two most recent books are Gearing Up for Learning Beyond K-12 and The New Digital Storytelling, Second Edition. Please join me as we welcome Dr. Alexander. Thank you very much. <laughs> I feel like I have to say, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, <laughs> thank you very much for uh, that really kind introduction. Uh, I wish I could be dressed as stylishly as you. Yeah. <laughs> um, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I live in Vermont, so it was really a pleasure to go to the warm, sunny south. <laughs> so thank you for, uh, for giving me that change of place. I really appreciate it. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Very good. I'm a native New Yorker, so I'm accustomed to shouting at people. So if no one can hear me, I get a little nervous. So, um, there are all kinds of things that I want to talk about. And all kinds of, yes, please. You have your cell phone in your pocket. Yeah, it's giving me some fun feedback. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
there's no use in having a presentation unless you break technology right away. <laughs> I, uh, I gave a talk once at a uh, big conference in Oregon, and the uh, first thing I did was plug in my laptop into the, uh, you know, into the network, and it flashed onto the screen in front of a thousand people the blue screen of death right away. That was a PC, so I appreciate this. About a third of the audience were Mac people, and they're like, ha, ha, ha. And then the rest said the, rest said the same thing happened to us. Like, well, how can this be? How can this be? I went, to the camp, I went to the conference center hotel desk and said, what's wrong? What's wrong? And they said, oh, yeah, this happens. We're just used to it. OK. Uh, don't, note to self, do not come back here again. Now, what I'd like to do is, unfortunately, show you a bunch of PowerPoint slides. Um, if I tell people I'm not going to use PowerPoint, they often stand and applaud, tears in their eyes, because we all hate PowerPoint. But what's curious about it is we also all love PowerPoint. We teach it in elementary school. We use it in every program on Earth. It's one that has no real replacement. Uh, we've invented dozens and dozens of technologies to go beyond it. So you may have used Prezi. Uh, I'm using Keynote. It's the same thing. Um, it's interesting, the 1980s technology that we just can't go past. So when you think about the future, when you think about emerging technologies, it's important to remember that the old tends to stay on. Now, uh, in case you're wondering uh, what my background is, why I can be speaking to you for the next hour, uh, let me just mention a few different things. Uh, first, I created what's called the Observatory for the Future of Education. This is a multimedia, uh, social, uh, publicly crowdsourced event where we take a look at the future of education technology. It includes a few different pieces. Um, one of them is a monthly trend analysis. Uh, this is a look at current events from the previous month, everything in it documented, footnoted extensively, played against a map of about 86 trends. Uh, we've been tracking these for about six years. And these trends, I'm not going to read this slide to you. Anybody who reads this much text to you should just be shot. Um, I just want to point out the general shape here. We have a bunch of trends, what we call education and context. So that's education itself, education reform, tenure, that kind of thing, as well as the context around it. So you think about, say, uh, changes in economics or demographics. Then we take a look at technology as it changes outside of education. And as you can see from that column, there's tons of things to track. Then we take a look at the intersection. And we combine all of these in a few different ways, one that may be called the higher education crisis. Or I'm going to be showing you a few of these trends because of what you're doing with your strategic planning process, I'm going to emphasize technology. I'm going to begin with a couple of contextual trends, but then dive into technology. If you'd like to learn more about this, just go to ftte.us. You can find tons of back uh, reports. It's, an, it's a fascinating, fascinating thing to do. Nobody else is doing this at this level. That's a publication that's pushed out. We also do a weekly video conference discussion that is unique as far as I can tell. I grab some brilliant person, some great thinker or practitioner, uh, everything from college presidents, the occasional provost, faculty, startup leaders, uh, critics, journalists, scholars of technology, and we talk for an hour. No PowerPoint allowed. Uh, we just have about 100 people having a conversation around the world. And we archive the whole thing to YouTube. We've been doing this for two years. We have about 100 different YouTube recordings. It's like nothing else. It's not a webinar because people actually talk and they communicate with each other which is kind of shocking. Now, um, I can talk some more about other publications, but you get the idea of stuff. Now, as we go, by the way, um, I'd like to reserve time for questions at the end, of course. But if you have comments or questions in the meantime, please don't be shy. And if I go over something too quickly, or if I say something that sounds like a lost page from a Dr. Seuss book or something, please stop me. Just shout or throw something. Um, I, I want to make sure that no one gets left behind when we proceed. So to begin with, let me give you a couple of contextual things to just keep in mind when you think about technology. And when you think about technology, we can drill down pretty far. We can make jokes about macros to PC. We can talk about metadata. We can talk about programming languages. But all this happens in a series of overlapping contexts that really change things. So the first one I want to mention is demographic. This is to degree. I would think obvious and well known, but it's not really. And there's a lot of recent research in this I want to pull your attention to. So one is in the US, we're seeing this fascinating development where our youth population, generally speaking, is shrinking, both in relative and absolute terms. And our senior population, 
population is growing, which is a fantastic, fantastic thing. It's a great triumph for civilization. The only way we can do this is because of developments in public health, in medical technology, in our knowledge of nutrition. I mean, it's a fantastic achievement. It's not the way we've normally lived. This is what human history looked like until around 1950. This is what parts of the world still look like. This is a demographic analysis of Nigeria, sliced by age group. And you can see that each slice is about four or five years. So in the very, very bottom of this cake, you have age zero to four, then five to nine, 10 to 14, and so on. And you can see from the shape that humans are fantastic at spamming the environment with babies. And then mortality sets in. And year by year, we have fewer and fewer of this. And this shape helps explain a lot of things. For example, the structure of Confucianism in East Asia, or the generation of elders in Africa, and so on. This is Japan today. That pyramid is flipped upside down. Japan has a small number of kids, a large number of middle-aged people, and a larger still number of seniors. And because of the nature of demographics, and because Japan is pretty, uh, pretty resistant to immigration, this is going to accelerate. This pyramid will get sharper, if I can mangle the metaphor. It's not just Japan. You can see this in many other countries as well. Germany, much of northern Europe, and big chunks of the US. I come from Vermont. Our median age is about 46. Uh, again, this is in many ways a triumph, and you help play a role in making this happen. Because we know statistically from around the world, the more education women get, the fewer kids they have and or later in life. So you helped transfer us into this dynamic. The US itself, we look more like this. Uh, you can see bigger boomers get their own special color. Why? American culture. Um, but also, this is unusual for us. I call this the refrigerator <coughs> diagram because, you know, it looks like a refrigerator. But this is strange for American history. Uh, we think of ourselves as a youthful nation. We pride ourselves on our youth culture. And yet, we're heading this way. If immigration begins to cut down, we might start looking more like a Japanese demographic. And this has powerful implications for everything in American society. And you all know, and you all have seen this in different ways. When it comes to education, you have to think about the way that in many senses, this is kind of the model we have for the traditional age undergrad. This is the thinking we have for uh, K through 12. But instead, we have what may be a best lifelong learning, and at worst, a real crisis for education and enrollment. Sorry. The clicker got out of control. So demographics, that's one thing that's shaping us. And again, you want to think too, it's easy to have cliches about 18-year-old whiz kids and 65-year-olds who can't use technology. Generally speaking, though, the younger you are in America, the more technology you use. The older you are, the less technology, generally speaking. There's only one major exception to this that I found. Which technology, let me ask you, is primarily used by middle-aged and older people? What would you guess? No, you'd think, right? No, that's a universal contagion. Ah, Facebook, we might be headed that way, it depends. But it's LinkedIn. Which I think it was easier then. Um, but you, you think of, if, you're, if you're 14, why would you use LinkedIn? There's no point. I mean, it's not, there's nothing to get from it. YouTube podcast is another one. But here's a second contextual force I want you to think about, which is what happened to economic inequality? Now, this is really, really interesting, because this happened in our lifetimes, no matter how old you are. Look at this chart. This is drawn from the work of Manuel Saiz and Thomas Piketty. And there are many, many charts like it. Just to you know, look at it very carefully for a second. The vertical axis measured inequality. So the higher the vertical axis, the more unequal. So if you were at you know, 100%, you'd have Bill Gates and a bunch of peasants. The horizontal axis represents time. I don't know if you can make out the complete date, but you get the sense of the curve. The very far left edge, say 1910. We were pretty good at inequality. We were pretty unequal. And by we, this is the US, but also a few other countries, Canada, Australia, and the UK. Then from around 1915 to 1950, that inequality plummeted. See, okay? I really am standing here, and, and you're craning your neck over. And we dropped. We became less unequal, we became more equal. And the reasons are kind of obvious. We had two spectacular world wars that demolished a whole bunch of wealth. 
Well, I was talking about Steven Pinker, arguments over that, that's one reason. We had the Great Depression, which was global in impact, that we had a whole bunch of social policies that really redesigned how we, how we process wealth. Think in the US about the New Deal, for example. And then something really strange happens. Around 1950 to about 1980, we were the least unequal we'd ever been. It's extraordinary. Some economists call this the Great Compression. If you think about quite a bit of American culture from that period. And then around 1980, that reversed. And you can see inequality taking off. And right now, we're circa 1915 levels. Um, I sometimes call this the Great Gatsby Curve. Uh, I used to call it the Downton Abbey Curve. People go, oh, wonderful, great clothing. No, <laughs> it, it means you're the help. No one likes it so much. Now. But, um, but this is crucial for our time for a few reasons. One is that during the Great Compression period, that's when we rebuilt higher ed. That's when the federal government got itself into financial aid. That's when we boosted enormously the community college system. That's when we grew out state systems. That was when we decided that higher education should be for pretty much everybody. That's not our time now. And one of the reasons why you see higher creaking in the wind and stressing and fumbling and breaking is because it's the wrong era. The second you want to think about is your students are going into that world into the world of escalating inequality. And so far, nothing is slowing that escalation back. In fact, some historians have been arguing that this compression in the middle is a historical blip, an anomaly, an aberration, that the real historical curve is we're in now. When you think about your students, are you preparing them for a middle class that is arguably dwindling? Are you preparing them for the elite in the economic terms? What's the function of higher education in this different world? These are painful questions that we have to ask. Along with that, what it means to work has changed in some ways. Uh, one is, some of you might remember in the 1990s, this big push that we're going to transfer the American workplace from manufacturing to the creative economy, to the information economy. We're very excited by that. And half of that came true. We pulled out a lot of people from manufacturing, yes. But we didn't put many people into the creative information economy. We put a lot of money into that, but we employed relatively few people. Most people now in the US work in the service sector, which pays less and is not as unionized and so That's one big change in labor. The second, I like to show my children classical films just to see how they respond. So I showed them the great satire network and they didn't think it was funny because that's what TV news is like now. That was kind of depressing. I showed them Mad Men and for them it's like watching Lord of the Rings because it's a completely alien world they have no idea of. And one of those alienations comes from the fact of this idea that you have one job, one career, one employer for life. They find that hilarious. Because now we live in what we call the gig economy, where we have multiple jobs, multiple careers, multiple employers often overlap. We call it the gig economy. In Australia, they call this the American economy. Just so you know. <laughs> That has huge implications for higher education. We're just really starting to get our, our arms around this. I mean, if you think about someone who goes to undergrad, they go to grad school, maybe to get their degree in a specific field, they go to work for this for life, and they're done. But here in a law school, right? That's a classic legal pattern. It's a classic career issue. That's decreasing right now. We really have to take lifelong learning a little bit more seriously. Two quick points, and we'll talk about technology. Unemployment is pretty low right now, which is a good thing. Participation is also low, which is not such a good thing. That is, people who could work, who could try to work, who remove themselves from the labor force. And this is increasing, partly because we have an aging population. We have more people staying home to care for elderly relatives, partly because of the growing opioid crisis, and partly we don't know why. But that participation rate has been declining for years, and that changes us. Last point, I'm going to come back to this, automation. We don't know how automation is going to affect work. For about 150 years, whenever we invented something new, we replaced it, or that replaced something old, and it was a, a painful process, but we grew something larger. So you think about the horse and buggy, when we invented the car, it was bad news for horse and buggy, but we now have Detroit. That used to be a good thing to say, but you know, we grew a huge industry, right? Or you think about, um, did you guys ship ice in the 19th century from here? Were you part of that economy? Do you know? Yeah. We had the Iceman. 
There are people who would cut ice from where I live. They ship it south to South Carolina. Right? Limited refrigeration, bad news for the ice industry, but we grew something larger. <coughs> Depending on the stats you read, that process, that growth process, seems to have paused around 1995. A lot of the digital technologies that we create don't employ a lot of people. Some of you may remember when Kodak went under. In Rochester, New York, they employed tens of thousands of people. That same week, Instagram, which helped destroy them, employed about 250. So it's possible. We don't know yet, but it's possible. We'll be heading to a world of widespread underemployment. Unemployment. Your students change as a result of all of this. And I think a lot of this you know about. More and more first generation students, uh, more students who have military experience, more students with learning disabilities. Why? We're not fully sure why. And we have more and more adult learners. Uh, I know that's a key part of, uh, of what you do at, at RWU. We'll see more of that. Last point, we're going to talk about technology. Over the past generation or two, we have, in many ways, transformed how we pay for higher education. A quick show of hands. How many of you are still paying off student loans? Keep those hands up. Those of you who don't have your hands up, just look around and look at the number. I'm going to guess it's about 40% of this room. Think about that. We haven't done this before in history. This is a new thing in the US. We used to have relatively low cost, generally speaking, relatively lower costs. We used to have healthy state support for public higher education. We have removed that right now, and we have instead financialized how we pay for higher education. Current amount of student debt is closing in at $1.4 trillion, which does sound like a lot of money. All of those are contexts for shaping when you decide to put a mobile device in your classroom or to use a new digital repository or when you think about what your students use when they go home at night for technology to access your classes. Let's think about technology for a second. This is one of my favorite photos. It's called tabloid and tablet. Just a very nice combination to have. Here are a few of the technologies that are obviously huge. And we could talk about just technology by itself without even going to the classroom for the next, what, three weeks, just nonstop because there's so much going on. Let me just mention a few of the huge developments that simply have happened and continue to grow. One is mobile. Um, quick show of hands. How many of you are iPhone users? How many of you are Android users? So this is always happens. It always happens. You say, who's an iPhone user? Me, I love the iPhone. Android is the biggest worldwide. It has the biggest market share. It's the biggest operating system in the world. Fascinating. It doesn't have the love that the iPhone has. But mobile is obviously enormous. Mobile has changed lots of stuff. And if you're in the US, you don't really grasp how much the change has happened. The US came very, very late to mobile devices, and we're still behind in many ways. If you go to the rest of the world, they've been talking about mobile learning since the 1990s. Mobile is, in many, many ways, the most powerful technology that we have. The second thing to think about is social media, which we will pretty soon stop calling social media, just call it media. Because if it's not social, it's unusual. We'll call it, say, library catalogs, or uh, the LMS, because so much of the world is social right now. Uh, we complain that Facebook might be losing people. Um, I would love to have two billion users and have that kind of problem of you know, losing a few thousand here and there. Uh, cloud computing, uh, we thought was radical, hip, shocking, exciting, dangerous, and then we just moved there. So it's, it's kind of a historical artifact at this point. Um, and we might not call it cloud computing. If you store all of your photos in Facebook or Flickr or Instagram, you are using cloud computing. If you don't use the name necessarily. Uh, digital video. Um, let me ask, um, who here would know? How much of your bandwidth goes to a video right now? Oh, 40%. We love digital video. We make it, we consume it, we suck down Netflix. Netflix is under the language right now. We use Google uh, Video. We make video from uh, webcams. We make video conferences. Even the technology isn't very good. We love video. Nothing slows this down. YouTube may be the world's single largest cultural artifact in connective tissue right now. Then we have gaming. Show of hands here. How many of you have played a computer game in the past two months? How many of you have never played a computer game? How many of you think this question makes you uncomfortable? <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. 
Are you uh, playing with 3D printers at all? No, actually, I play uh, Sudoku, so I didn't know quite that. That counts. That counts as a game. <laughs> all right. No, no, don't apologize. That's fine. That's fine. I mean, there's basically two populations in North America who don't acknowledge or recognize or engage in computer gaming. One of them is the Amish, and the other one are academics. We uh, really, <laughs> if you don't use computer, if you don't use computer games, if you play Sudoku, which is great, I try to avoid because it's addictive to me. Right? It's already changed your life in a few ways. If your laptop is good enough to have nice quality Netflix video or video conferencing, it's not because you play Excel uh, or Word. It's because 95% of the users are video games. So they've upgraded the sound, they've upgraded the CPU, they've upgraded the memory, the graphics processor, and so on. And the second is, it changes the movie interfaces. So if you watch American TV news, which you never should, but if you do, turn this out, I'll have to leave. And look at the screen. All the information streaming across it is fascinating. You're not going to encounter that almost anywhere else in your life, except, say, the cockpit of the jet fighter, except computer news. If you look at TV news from the 1970s, it looks almost naked. There's one person talking to you, maybe a little ago. It's scary to watch right now. Computer games are widely played by all genders, all ages, all ethnicities in the US. They're a global industry, enormously powerful, meticulously designed, a fierce competition of the marketplace. Behind me, this slide gives you a sense of some of the current technologies. Well, let's push it a little bit further forward. In the 1990s, there's a movement called the Cypherpunk which was concerned with surveillance and privacy. There were people who were worried that they were being surveyed massively. If the word got out, people would riot in the streets. So this gentleman behind me proved extensively that the government surveyed the US population and the world population in ways that may be unethical or certainly illegal. And our response was, OK. And we moved on. Uh, you know, we, we basically had almost no reaction at all. The reaction you're getting now against Google and Facebook is interesting. It feels a little like a therapeutic subconscious response to that. Or, oh yeah, yeah, privacy was a good idea. When did we last have that? And we go a little further forward. Uh, this gentleman is one of the founders of Wired Magazine. He has a couple of recent books that are pretty interesting. And as an English professor, I'm excited that he distills contemporary technology into eight verbs, eight gerunds, which makes me very happy. I just want to pull out four of them because they're especially important. This is a top level sense of technology. The four I'm going to talk about. Uh, screening just means that we like using screens. It's kind of obvious, but it's true. Uh, flowing means that we like moving content between devices, so you like to move between your phone and your laptop. Uh, remixing means that we like to combine content. And interacting means not just we like to pick menus, but we like to make things interact. The four big things I want to draw attention to. The first is accessing. Uh, we're the library team. We have our library director. And what part of the library is yours? I am the library director at the law school. Oh, fantastic. Just downstairs? Just downstairs. Excellent. Great. Are you going to the library or is there anything ahead of here? We're at it. You're at it? Yeah. Oh, library Moffat right there. <laughs> <laughs> These two ladies have a problem that uh, afflicts the library profession uh, that you have already participated in, which is libraries used to assemble uh, materials. They used to assemble collections that would stand the test of time. They now increasingly assemble licenses instead where they give you access to content. So you're using LexisNexis uh, or JSTOR. Uh, and you, instead of owning the documents, be they physical or not digital, you're owning the access to them. Uh, how many of you listen to Spotify? Head of art? Apple Music? See the hand goes up, of course. Of course, yeah, right? Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm, a YouTube, I'm a YouTube listener because my musical taste is too bizarre. Um, as I was telling you last night, if I'm trying to listen to, I listen to a lot of death metal and classical. And so Pandora just panics when it looks like musical taste. So, um, the thing that these all have in common is we don't own any of it. We have Netflix streaming, but we don't own the DVDs. We don't even hold them in our hands. We have, as a civilization, decided that we would rather access and own an offline material. That's important. That's a big shift. We haven't really spoken about it, but there it is. The second is sharing, or what lawyers quaintly call rampant copyright violation. <laughs> um, we love to share stuff. Uh, how many of you made remix tapes back in the day? Yeah, yeah. Uh, have you seen that little meme that goes around? It's an audio cassette with a pencil. 
Because if you know what these two have to do with each other, you're from a certain time period. <laughs> um, but that was terrible technology. And we loved it. We'd make tapes. I won't ask how many of you did VHS to VHS tapes, because that was <clears throat> not always legal. <laughs> and I won't talk about the many technical ways you could make that. Well, you're nodding vigorously. That's really good sign. <laughs> the reason is we love sharing stuff. We love sharing recipes. We love sharing clothes. We love sharing news stories. And that's just how we use the digital technology. It's a key part that we don't normally fully appreciate. And we're going to keep doing more of that. On the top is cognifying. And you've already experienced this. This is the addition of some intelligence, maybe artificial intelligence, to your digital environment. So if you type in something into Google, and it starts suggesting autocomplete for you, not based on spelling, but based on who you are. So if I type in, say, for example, uh, cafe, it'll suggest something that's physically near me if I'm logged in at that point. If I type in, say, Gothic, it'll finish something based on my scholarship. It's trying to cognify things and make them sharper and more intelligent. Think about Amazon's recommendation system as a kind of early stage part of that. Think about more and more tools being cognified. So think about, say, AutoCAD, being able to call on a computer suggest things. Think about your LMS or library software. That's another big problem. The other is filtering. Uh, we had this problem of information overload, uh, which we complained about. I had to do a workshop on information overload, so what the Amazon was offering to do, and it searched for information overload. And the first book that came back was published by Zondervan, a religious publisher i.e., we need prayer to survive, we need divine intervention to survive. That was a good sign. Um, if you want, I hope you've seen this, um, there's an issue of the uh, Journal of the History of Ideas that looked at early modern information overload, 1400 to 1700. People complain about having too much to read. It's, it's depressing as hell. Yes. Oh, I have 20 books. How will I read them? Yeah. Um, what's interesting is that when we had information overload, we invented new stuff to take care of it. That's where the encyclopedia came from. That's where new forms of martial arts are coming from. And right now, we're inventing more and more ways. One of them is filtering. So this is where Apple Music has all those playlists. This is where people go to, say, bloggers who focus on a specific topic because they can filter out information. Increasingly, we're learning the filter to proceed. These eight terms, these eight verbs, outline a different kind of technology world for us than we're used to now. And automation, we can talk about this for a long time. A lot of ways that automation is changing. Um, in many ways, our best bet is to think about science fiction to understand what's happening, because we really don't have a lot of good models of that. So, for example, I just love showing this photo. This is a drone with a chainsaw. Why? It's a drone with a chainsaw! You don't need a reason. <laughs> Which country do you think did this first? What would you guess? Russia. You'd think. Very close, but wrong. Where? Ukraine. Oh, that's too close. No, no. <laughs> Who else? Who else? No one's in the US, you'd think, right? This is Finland. They have a special relationship with trees. Um, why am I talking about this? Because automation is already huge. And we're not fully aware of what it is now, much less what it's going to be. So you take a look at industry, not here in the Northeast. In the Midwest, there are enormous amounts of robotics in the industry. South Korea is one of the world's leaders in this right now. Worldwide, you have the phenomenon of dark factories. These are factories that work at night with the lights off. Because robots don't need any light. They work entirely by receiver, by other sensors as they receive. We have self-driving cars. As bad as they are now, they're better than humans. I mean, the, one of the bigger drivers of uh, uh, self-driving cars is insurance companies. Because they recognize that pretty quickly, you will be a downside if you drive a car. It's like if you decide to eat nothing but cheese and smoke a lot. Yeah, you can do that. You'll pay a price in insurance. Already, humans are kind of second-rate citizens on most of the self-driving car accidents are because of those psychopathic, ill-conceived monsters, us, hitting them. <laughs> we also have robots at war. I mean, we're having some weird science fiction discussions <coughs> right now. If a drone blows up the wrong building, who's responsible? Is it the operator? It might be in a tin can in Florida. Is it the software? Is it the local commander? We're still trying to figure this out. We use, in many ways, robots to defuse bombs. We use them to defuse terrorists. We're automating more and more of them. We also have high frequency trading. I don't think you guys have followed this. This is one of the strangest things. If you haven't followed it, it's already changed now. That is, we have Wall Street firms that write software to trade. I mean, the basic principle of trading, buy low, sell high, is already an algorithm. And they have really fine-tuned algorithms that buy and sell really, really quickly. In fact, they've moved some hedge fund companies physically closer together. So they can get not a millisecond, but a tenth of a second advantage of each other. And those software programs work 
on their own for a while, buying and selling, shaping the global economy. Every so often they have a glitch and they kind of crash parts of the economy and they come back up very fast. The post-human economy that you already inhabit, that's not science fiction, that's last year's news. On top of this, we have, we've taught soccer to write. Not good poetry yet. Pretty bad poetry, that's okay. Uh, we've taught to write some journalism. Sports journalism, meteorology, and finance journalism. The LA Times is a tool called Claybot, which will tell you the news of earthquakes, which is pretty useful. We have creativity as well. We have tools that actually try to create art in audio, in video, and in images. So this is a photo I took of a friend of mine, he's Canadian, therefore he immigrated to Canada to Mexico City. And there he is, trying to look at him. I fed this program to a Google program, which turned it into a psychedelic piece. I didn't do anything for this. You can take that and feed it back in, it gets even trippier as you go along. My point is, automation right now is already a powerful force in the world. We're going to come back to that. Uh, we mentioned mobile. It's important to know that if you look at a web page now, and you see, instead of three columns, you see one column. Instead of 20 pictures, you see one picture. It's not because they assume you're an idiot, unless you're looking at a TV news website, which means they do assume you're an idiot. It's because they assume you're most likely looking at this on a phone, with a smaller screen or a tablet. If you're using a desktop or a laptop computer, you're kind of a minority citizen. You're not quite a full range of user right now. People are designing for mobile first, but large parts of the world not in education. We're still assuming the desktop computer. In fact, the mobile world is now so complex, so diverse, it has so many things going on, it's really hard to keep track of. This is Nielsen, the uh, people who try to track TV viewing. This is their attempt to schematize the number of devices that we watch TV on. As you can tell, it's pretty vast. Now, we talk about a little more recent technology. You're shaking your head in fear already. <laughs> what, do you, what do you do? I'm the service desk manager. Oh, that, God, and you still smile. This guy's suffering from one of the most terrible problems in psychology, which is in behavioral psychology. If you give somebody nothing but negative reinforcement, they eventually go insane. <laughs> so these poor guys, all you do is you come to them and say, my thing doesn't work. It's broken. Help me out. If it's worked perfectly, we never come to them. I'll do this. Whenever I go to the service desk, I'll say, my network is fine. Thank you. <laughs> oh, what's that? So, virtual reality is an ugly term. It dates back to the 1990s. We had the first wave of VR. We tried to make things happen. Uh, I was a grad student at the University of Michigan. I taught classes using VR. It was kind of fun then. I won't steam by the way. Uh, virtual reality can go in a few directions right now. Uh, this is one. This is actually apparently a very positive event. The photo looks like something nightmarish. Uh, this was an event in Spain where Mark Zuckerberg gave thousands of people a uh, free VR gear. Uh, but it looks like something nightmarish and terrifying. It's possible. VR could go bad in a lot of ways. Uh, there aren't any standards across platforms. Uh, there are possibility of capturing lots of information as you use VR, I'm not sharing it. Uh, no one trusts Facebook, for example. So it could be a dystopian future. It could also be a stupid future. This is the worst photograph of technology taken in the 21st century. Uh, I actually have half convinced this was deliberately designed to make fun of it, although the article is very positive. This is Palmer Lucky, who's not a good person, but he's one of the editors of Oculus Rift. And he looks like a moron. This is terrible. But it's possible that VR will collapse, that we won't do much with it. Uh, you think about 3D TV? No, no one thinks about 3D TV, because it died. You think about 3D films? They're barely existing at all right now. If it weren't for Avatar, they would have gone. VR is tricky, it's complicated, it's expensive at times, it's very, very challenging. It might not go very far, it might just be a niche. This is, I think, the most likely vision of the future. I love this photo so much. So on the right side, we have the most powerful man in the world, we have President Obama, trying to look as cool as he can while looking at the door. And he's using the technology, and he's really clearly having a blast. He's really enjoying it. What I think is interesting is on the left side, that woman could care less. She's totally bored by this. She's checking the email, right, instead of this. Um, what I mean by this is we could simply see VR as part of life, as a production tool, something that we simply use on an everyday basis. It doesn't necessarily become sexy or get a lot of attention, but we use it. I think this is most likely. It's like word processing, a phrase we don't even use anymore, but we all use the technology all the time. I would watch a VR to do this. 
Now, if you haven't experienced VR, you absolutely have to. <coughs> do you have a tilt brush running out of your, uh, of your hardware? Uh, I do not. Try to find a copy of that. For, for example, tilt brush is a, is a paint program, which lets you draw, but you draw in 3D. So one thing I can do is I can draw a door to decorate it, and then I can walk through it and look in from the side. My only caution to you is you can do this addictively. <laughs> because it's so complex and rich. If you haven't had a chance to look into VR, it's not like looking at a view master, for those of you who know what that is. It has incredible depth to it. But the storytelling possibilities are very, very deep. I, I was downloading uh, a VR document for very bad hard work. Oh, man, it was bad. But the VR level was terrific. I put, oh my god, I was looking inside. I was sitting in the house. The house is kind of falling apart. And in front of me, sitting on the sofa, was an old woman who was telling me something. And I couldn't help it. I leaned forward to hear her. Because it wasn't completely loud enough, very smoothly. And as she was talking, I heard sounds behind me. So I turned around and then turned back to apologize. Because I felt rude to do that. I'm with technology for that. This doesn't happen to me usually. It really sucked me in. The noises kept happening. I got more and more nervous. My heart started going faster. This was a throwaway document. This wasn't a major work of art. We're just starting to explore what this could be on. I recommend paying attention to it. The inverse of virtual reality is augmented reality. Again, another term from the 1990s. If virtual reality means creating a virtual environment that you can inhabit, look at, explore, augmented reality flips it inside out. That takes the digital content and it ties it to the physical world. And most of you have experienced some weak form of this. Uh, if you've used Google Maps while you're walking or driving, well, you're not supposed to use it when you're driving, um, and it tells you where you are based on where you are. That's a form of augmented reality. If you use a tool like Yelp, for example, a little more challenging when you have visual superimposed. So this is an app that pulls down historical photos in London based on where you're standing. So you can see that's a 1930s photo, more or less overlapping the physical photos right now. The part of defense uses this for all kinds of great obvious reasons. IBM had a program for people going to Wimbledon to, to the great tennis match. So they can look around the town and then give you the information about each building you were looking at, which is pretty useful to have. Augmented reality was something I've been talking about for 10 years. It finally got mainstream acceptance in the US with Pokemon Go, where you had people chasing things all over the place. My favorite one, though, is in Pokemon Go. It's a game called Zombie Run. Anyone of you play that? Have you played it? Yeah. Do you want to describe it or should I? Because I feel like you can describe it. That's fine. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's a zombies game. People love zombies right now. Anyway, zombie University. But we also love zombies as a, as a creature. It's a zombies game where you are in a post apocalyptic environment. You have to be sur surviving chased by zombies, except they're tied to your physical environment. It's a jogging and exercise game. So you put it on, you start to run, and it says, all right, there are zombies are coming, you have to run 0.6 of a mile. Go. Okay, I'm pretty good. Then you hear the zombies. Uh, and if you run very slowly, uh, they get louder, so you run faster. So across the world, in these spectrums of people running desperately, you know, being chased by invisible zombies. And if you get to the point, you get, if you survive the mission, you get points, and it ties into the overall. All that is a form of augmented reality. Does that sound right? Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to say anything more, I understand it. That's <laughs> fun. What if you combine these? Now, this is where things get really, really interesting, and we're still figuring this out. And maybe our Microsoft gentleman will be able to tell us something about this, because Microsoft <coughs> is doing more than any other company on Earth to advance this. If you combine virtual reality and augmented reality, you have what we call mixed reality, or combined integrated reality. So imagine, for example, being able to point your phone at the sky and get information about what you're looking at live as you go. And information can be very detailed and complex. You can see that here. This is a screenshot from a company that may change the world or may not. To start in Florida called Magic Leap, they're all about making tools like this. They haven't released anything that we can get our hands on yet, but they've stuck down billions of dollars of funding. Meanwhile, Microsoft has a HoloLens, which simply works. You put this thing on your head, if I had this on right now, I could add a copy of Outlook to that wall. I could put Pandora on the ceiling, and it would freak out if you want to play for me. And I could take a photo of one of my cats and put it on the wall here. Missing from this is a mouse and keyboard. I work my voice, my touch, my motion. Arguably the most revolutionary digital technology since the mouse and keyboard. 
Keep an eye on this reality. So now we can go a little further forward. I'm conscious of time. We have a lot to cover. Okay. Okay. So one thing to think about is this. We've been shrinking technology since forever, and we keep doing that. This is a screenshot or a photo of a product from my home monitor for the University of Michigan. It's, uh, it has a little bit of memory, it has some sensors to record data, and a little bit of wireless that can upload them to the cloud. It's the size of a grain of rice. This isn't new. This is actually located for real in the Computing History Museum in San Francisco. We're reaching a point of where we think of invisible computing, computing that's woven into everyday life uh, in ways that we call ubiquitous computing. Another term for that is the Internet of Things. That is, you have to imagine having, say, different wheels of your car generating data that you can access from your own. Uh, a good friend of mine runs a virtual technology from the state of Tennessee. Fantastic. Their house is full of things like a smart egg carton, which has sensors at the bottom of each little cup. They can tell you how much the eggs weigh. Is this crazy? It might be. But you can actually tell if the egg has gone off because its temperature, its weight changes as it gets in us. We're trying to add more and more devices to interlink more of the physical environment in ways everything from clothing to appliances to people and pets. We aren't quite sure the full range of where this could go yet. But one thing about that hyperlink that you click on a web page, imagine hyperlinking to your entire physical environment. That's the dream of the Internet of Things. There are all kinds of issues with this, which we can come back to. Then there's this. All the digital world. The physical world keeps happening. And I was asking, I'm sorry, give me your name. Susanna. I was asking Susanna about 3D printing. Um, 3D printing has really changed. Uh, and if you haven't played with a 3D printer, I really recommend it. Because on the one hand, it looks kind of dull and industrial. On the other hand, you have this weird sensation. The sensation is, in the 1970s, we had 2D printing with Xerox machine. In Star Trek, we have the replicator. And right now, we're somewhere in between. It's a really weird sensation. And no one knows how far 3D printing is going to go. We can print a lot of strange stuff right now. We can print appliances, we can print toys, we can print art. The British print food, please don't look at it. It's British food, so it's horrifying to begin with. Uh, architects are competing to build more and more stuff out of 3D printing, including entire buildings uh, and bridges. NASA keeps trying to print things in zero G. Uh, we have medical uses, including printing body parts. And now that they push to print more and more tissue, it's not tissue. It is the print in Oregon. That's what we're working on right now. Here, you see a bunch of students around one 3D printer trying desperately to make it work. What I'm looking for is being able to 3D print 3D printers. We're about 90% there right now. And there are all kinds of issues around this. The phrase I want you to think about is 3D printing across the curriculum. Because I've seen departments across the US use it's not engineering, obviously engineering departments. But I've seen French, I've seen biology, I've seen classical studies. We can talk about Bitcoin at another time. Uh, blockchain is right now extraordinary technology as a whole. If you'd like to just think about this as a historical framework, we had the internet dating back to the 1960s. In the 1990s, we built the web on top of the internet. And we still have a lot of things that aren't in the web but use the internet, like iTunes, for example, or in many ways, a lot of mobile apps. Blockchain is technology using the internet but not the web. So I think of it as a kind of parallel universe to the web. It has all kinds of interesting things. One major use right now, its major goal is a sense of permanence. So don't think about using blockchain for your photo of your breakfast. Think about it as a place for storing things like student records or class documents or something you want to preserve for a long period of time. Well, counterintuitive thing with the strange cryptic technology for preservation. That's its main ambition right now. We'll come back to that. If you've been looking at blockchain, I strongly recommend it. It's very weird and counterintuitive. Try to get away from Bitcoin. It's a different world. That's one piece of blockchain technology. Right now, it's a crazy frenzy amount of speculation. Put that to one side, unless you want to play, in which case, go ahead. But think of blockchain separately. Now, let's bring this more into the classroom. Let's talk about a few specific issues. We have to spend so much time on technology because it's a wild, complicated world. We're going to get a few. So, a few things. The blended classroom, the flipped classroom, in many ways is progressing. I see this in K through all, as well as in uh, post secondary education. 
everything from people doing more classroom recordings to simply the idea of using the face-to-face -face environment for what face-to-face -face does best, and then using the digital world for what it does best. And there are many, many examples of this. Many campuses are doing more classroom capture for various reasons. We have more faculty trying to produce video. We have, at the same time, dynamics in the classroom. Ah, we come back to this. We also learning management system. Uh, you all run Sakai, right? That's so cool. That's impressive. Sakai is rare in the world right now. And it's in many ways the most technologically impressive LMS, I think, out there. The LMS world right now is fully mature. We have serious LMS providers that are out there. In the, I'm going to guess, Germany or Holland? My approach yes? uh, is further east, Hungary. Oh, oh, my apology. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know anything, Gary, because that would be the first. Well, I, I would love to learn more. Uh, I haven't even been to the I'd love to go. Uh, Hungarian history is fantastic. I, mean, I can't pronounce anything, uh, which is so horrible. Um, in Europe, we refer to the LMS as a virtual learning environment, the VLE. And you guys use a lot of Google, which is really exciting, I think. Um, why are we talking about this? Because the LMS world is in many ways stable. Most of the elements do what they did 10 years ago, which so were tweaks and, and, and slight advances. We're talking about the idea of blowing that up to create something called the next generation digital learning environment. What would happen if you could design an LMS or a VLE for the year 2018? Would it include more social media? Because right now the LMS is asocial, not antisocial. Would it include more open content and more open access materials? Would it disintegrate and reintegrate the federated way? I can't point you to a product out there. Now. People are trying to make this work, They're thinking about this. Keep an eye on this. Obviously, distance learning continues to grow. Uh, Clay Christensen predicted that around last year, we would have had par with the same number of students online, face to face. Not quite there yet. We're closing it on it in many ways. I should ask do you have an open access initiative on campus for scholarship? So I don't need to talk too much about that because you are the experts and we need to talk to you. Um, open it is a passionate movement across all post-secondary education around the world, growing incrementally in a few different ways. One is the idea of open education resources. And you're seeing this in the community college space in the US and the public higher ed space as well. Um, we have Z classes and Z degrees, Z and zero cost of materials, uh, which is a really powerful movement. And this is growing incrementally. We already have a great body of open education resources. A lot of the reason they haven't conquered the world is just it takes time to change a lot of people's mind streams and stuff. Because the quality is definitely there. We have open access and scholarly publishing. And this is a bitter, brutal war being fought across the world right now, which is are we going to have for profit proprietary scholarship companies like Elsevier or Wiley? Or will we destroy them all? and maintain them in an open access format. That's the stark form of the civil war. This is being fought in tenure committees, in grad programs, in courtrooms, in legislatures. I mean, it's a huge, huge debate. And meanwhile, open access continues to grow incrementally year by year. Meanwhile, we have the open teaching, which is basically taking your teaching practice and sharing it with the world. So you tweet about a class, or you tweet about a problem you're having, and you try to get feedback and responses. We have faculty who blog about their stuff, podcast about it. It's a fascinating development that goes against, in many ways, a lot of our training and the idea of having a classroom with a closed door of being a robot space. Yeah, please. So I was just stressing with people that'll teach you. Okay. <laughs> uh, there are a few more technologies, but I want to I want to shift away for a second and talk about some of the strategic implementations. Um, so I mentioned gaming and education, uh, and there are a lot of ways people use gaming. One is to have a game as multimedia content. So for example, uh, there's an international relations class in Pennsylvania at Dickinson College uh, where they have a class of hosts in Arab and Israeli politics. They play a game called Peacemaker, which is incredibly realistic, which is to say a very frustrating game. Uh, one player is a Palestinian authority, the other player is the Israeli government. And the students research the subject, play the game from one side, write about the experience, do some more research, play the game from the other side, that write about the experience and how to go. There are a lot of pedagogical tools for using games, including replayability and the fact that most games are designed as pedagogical tools to help you learn them very carefully. The other way is we have students or faculty making games. 
I don't mean games like Call of Duty. I mean smaller games. For example, at Gettysburg College, there was a professor who had his students make very, very small text-based games based on archaeological sites. So that you could play the game, welcome to this cathedral, and you get to walk through it. And the student had to design the games that you would see in the right places. Another way, and this might sound too 21st century, but in many ways not, is that game studies is an academic field. With peer reviewed journals, with scholarly books, with monographs, with endowed chairs, with classes all over the place. And as you think of games as multimedia artifacts, well, we have cinema and film studies. We have radio, the communication programs. It's natural to have games as part of that. In fact, libraries have whole systems of protocols for preserving games and rendering access to them, which is pretty interesting. So gaming is one thing I want you to keep in mind. And if you think gaming sounds too awkward and embarrassing, use the word simulation. Because in many ways, the two overlap in quite a few ways. Second thing to think about. I'm a humanist. My background is in literature. Uh, I managed to terrify all of my colleagues by talking about things like post-structuralist theory, gothic literature, that I taught Moby Dick, and they all love me. <laughs> so Moby Dick's impossible. But, Humanists are usually speaking the last to get on board digital technology uh, for all kinds of interesting reasons. But what we do, we do some interesting things. And now we have a movement called the Digital Humanities Movement. And the idea is to use digital technology to fulfill classic humanities questions and to ask interesting questions. And then use the technology for what we can do in positive or powerful ways. So for example, there are a series of fantastic web-based archives that are now scholarly grade material. For example, Walt Whitman, Andrew Dante Rosetti, or William Blake. And those are used by scholars that are doing research, and they're also used to anchor classes in class discussions. We also think about inventing new things. Um, we're ready to give the term distant reading. If you know the term close reading, where I grab a poem from you, because you write poems, I know it. And I read that sentence very, very closely. Instead, I can take a look at 100,000 poems at once, analyze them, generate a word cloud, look for networks of assignments between them all, and really change your understanding of literature. For example, imagine taking Google Books and looking at over 200 years and entering a few words to see how often they appear and when. So, for example, I'm taking the word fascism. Nothing until 1930. Obviously, it ticks up, it goes down in 1946. 1963, it comes back up again. That's interesting. It tells me something about your field, about 20th century history. And I want to dive into that and learn more. The digital humanities movement is very, very popular. And I gotta confess, it's actually growing. In the humanities, anything growing other than, say, cancer is a big step forward. <laughs> now, here's one thing I have to point out. Uh, I'm in a courtroom and I feel kind of awkward saying this. Um, can I ask you both to undertake a massive human experiment? This is hard. Hardest thing I'll ask you to do. Just, just for a moment, hypothetically, be nice to lawyers for the next 30 seconds. Just don't eat. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, you know, Joe, what do you call a pile of 10,000 dead lawyers? Go on. A star. A star, right? It's a cloud. I mean, people hate lawyers. I don't know anybody else, right? But just for a second, because the law field boomed from the 1970s up until about 10 years ago, and it's been collapsing ever since. One of the reasons for that collapse is technology. Because we can automate key chunks of law. So contract writing, we can automate parts of that. We can automate what's called access to justice. That is, if you're wrong, or you feel wrong, and you want to figure out a way to get legal redress, we can put parts of that online. And then we can go through documents and do e-discovery. We're automating more and more legal functions, which is pretty exciting and pretty challenging. Last point here. Social media or the web in general, is a new way for us as scholars to communicate with each other. If you think back, say, 40 years, we usually communicate by journal articles, by face-to-face -face meetings and conferences, and by snail mail. That's interesting. That worked. But now, the blogosphere for almost every academic discipline is an active, live thing. In macroeconomics, blogospheric arguments are changing the way we talk about economics now in many ways. We have grad students who grow up learning their discipline, not just by going to a professor or by going to a conference, but also by following complicated arguments in their field across social media. In many ways, Web 2.0 social media is now a key part of the community of scholarship. Ah, I'm conscious of your time. I'm going to move.
Can I give you this one slide, please? If you just, just be kind for a second. They're going to start chortling, turning red or something. I haven't talked about the library very much, which is unfortunate because libraries are some of the great heroes of 21st century America that we don't pay nearly enough attention to. If you think you've had to teach people technology in a challenging way, you haven't been to a library. My daughter will walk into a public library and say, please tell me about using HTML to design VRML. The library has to translate that sentence and help her gain resources. Next to her will be somebody who says, I have to use computers. I never have. Where do I start? The libraries have to answer all those people all at once in every single dimension between. Public libraries are many ways are just unsung heroes of how we access digital technology. So I have to say that that's a key part. But another part is that libraries are changing in ways that are fascinating and that libraries are fighting about all the time. Here are a couple of possible visions where those people go. One is the idea that collection development, as I said before, is not quite the major thing it used to be. So perhaps libraries become the information literacy mediators. They help people learn the skills for sussing out truth from non-truth and in between. This used to not be a very popular thing until the 2016 election, and now everybody's keenly excited about it. And librarians are the discipline or profession in higher education best suited for dealing with this. Nobody else has that training behind them. And they have this whole field of information literacy dating back to the 1980s. You can add to that digital literacy, and this may be one of the major functions of the library on campus right now. I'm saying on campus physically, but for online learning, it's the same function. The second is open scholarship. When I go to different campuses, it is inevitably libraries who are pushing open scholarship. Faculty don't usually have the training to talk about that, or necessarily the interest. The libraries have that training and capacity. They also, this might be interesting, say, I'm hearing this term, information entrepreneurship. So we have the great idea of the reference librarian. Have both of you on the reference librarian desk? Routine? Uh, no. Oh. <laughs> That's an amazing thing to do. But instead of being at that desk, for libraries to go out, librarians to go out into the community and mediate between people and information needs. Uh, I heard a passionate argument for this in faith by one of the leading research librarians in China who was arguing that this is where libraries should go in the future. These are a few changes to think about. Now, over the next few hours, you're going to be talking about this. You're thinking about technology in different ways. And one of the things I'd like to ask you to think about is all these different trends that I've shown you, you know, thinking about mixed reality, thinking about library, thinking demographics. You want to think first, which of these is really powerful? In terms of your own work, I have to ask you, what do you do here? <coughs> I'm the director of media and public relations for the university. Oh, fantastic. So all these trends hit you all the time, everywhere. Um, good luck. <laughs> I want to ask you about Pinterest later. I'll, I'll, talk about that. I'll come back to you about that. So one of the things you think about is how does this all, which of these trends is the most impact for you doing media relations, for example, or being an architect, or being a provost, or being a student, or being a parent? The trickier question is this. Which of these is the most difficult to predict? See, this is not, some of these are pretty predictable. Demographics, big then. Usually demographics have not change at all, usually. Some of these things are pretty intense. Now, we get pretty futuristic, but I am conscious of time. I've got 10, 15 in the corner. Yeah, you're supposed to take a break with me. What do you guys think? Keep going, keep going. Keep going. Go, go, run. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I like the sound of that. All right. Um, let me show you a couple of things. Very, very quickly. change it, reboot it, redesign the technology. You might say technology, yet yeah, think about all those other impacts as well. Think about the economics of this, think about the demographic of this. Uh, so for example, what I'm doing right now is pretty weird. What I'm doing right now is kind of what you used to do in the 1600s. I'm hectoring you, you're sitting there taking notes, or falling asleep, or wondering, does this beer really stop us we all in the center of the earth? I mean, whatever you're thinking about, this is a pretty classical pattern. Right? We have many ways of going. So we have active learning, we have other technologies, we have classical architecture. So for example, uh, if we had some way of having them do work individually, I could lecture for five minutes and then come out and then wander around and see what they're doing. 
at this, to go get that, and move back and forth. We also have the possibility of taking the whole physical campus and making it through the Internet of Things one giant classroom, or one giant library, or one giant media relations part of campus. So if you walk across campus, remember that photo of 1930s London superimposed? Imagine pulling that information down about downtown Providence or about this campus. Imagine having data, put your phone and point it at a building, be able to figure out who's in that building right now and how to reach them. We can really blend the campus. Imagine the mixed reality campus. We'll talk to architects about that, as well as the director of IT. Second thing to think about. This is a cover from the most boring magazine in the United States. <laughs> this is a magazine that has no imagination at all. That's why you buy it. If you don't know, this is a place that this is a magazine that reports on uh, consumer products. Toasters, cars, flip-flops, and higher education. This was their cover. The reason I'm mentioning this is because this isn't some crank opinion. So this is general sense since about 2008 that higher education is in a major, major crisis mode. Here's why. Obviously, there's anxiety about cost. And the cost is often overblown. Where people think of the sticker price but not the actual price students pay, it doesn't matter. The anxiety is enormous, it's very, very large. And if our pricing is opaque and hard to understand, that's another reason for the anxiety and problems. Second is the anxiety around debt. This can be overblown. NPR, New York Times, they love stories of the barista with $200,000 of debt. That's crazy. That's an outlier. But the median amount of debt is about $30,000. That's a lot of money. That's historically unprecedented for the U.S. for higher education. That has a big impact on how people live. Another is grad schools. I mentioned law schools having problems. There's some MBA classes that are shrinking right now. There's a real question about how we Overall, total enrollment in American higher education has been down for six years. It'll probably go down a little further next year once the impact of immigration will be too. Yeah. On top of this, this political pressure. Some of you might remember back in the day, there used to be this kind of reliable movie theater where you have Democrats and Republicans, right? Democrats would say, education is awesome. Republicans would say, ah, it's a feat of godless communism. And Democrats would say, no, no, these are great teachers in back. That's pretty reliable. And then 2008 happened, and a bunch of Democrats said, actually, education is broken, we need to fix it. And by Democrats, I mean people like President Obama. Um, you get de Democrats for education reform. You get many, many Democrats who are making the same argument, saying that, you know, teachers unions are too powerful, they should be stopped. If you've seen the uh, TV show, A House of Cards, on Netflix, it's a fascinating show in a lot of ways. The first season, our protagonist breaks a teacher's union. And it's important to know that at no point do we know his political party. It could be higher at that point. So we have all this pressure on higher education. And it gets worse. We were talking before about the zombie campuses. Um, I coined this awful term. Hello. Hello. You Hello. came to the darkest moment of the talk. <laughs> it'll, it'll get nicer. Um, it's all good. In, no, but this part's good. <laughs> um, in chess, you have the queen sacrifice. It's a desperate move where you give up your most powerful piece to try and win the game. In higher education, we have a move where we close academic programs and get rid of faculty. Now, I don't just necessarily mean adjuncts, I mean tenure track or tenure faculty. We've been tracking this for years, it's been happening across the country. My favorite example was the College of St. Rhodes in Albany, New York, where the president uh, laid off about 10% of the entire tenure faculty. And the next year, got an award from the Albany Area Business Council, all being protested by the surviving faculty. Um, this is not a sign of a healthy uh, industry in many ways. This is what we have to hold on to. This is a fascinating chart. In any way, this is what we call the college premium. That is, if we took two of you, um, what do you do here? I'm the uh, chief financial officer. Oh, let's talk. So, what's your name? Jared. So, Jared, um, if we had two Jareds, one Jared goes to high school, then leaves school, goes to the workforce. The other Jared goes to college and gets an degree. That goes into the workforce. Jared two will make more money on average than Jared one. Call this the college premium. How much is it? Well, it's a substantial amount. And this gender divide here oh, is shameful and embarrassing for the United States in the 21st century. We need to stop. We can talk about the reason that it happened, but it's a horrible thing. Now think about the average between the two. 
Let's say you make, let's say Jared too, hypothetically, makes $400,000 in his life more by going to college. $30,000 in debt, that's a good investment. That's a really good investment. This is in many ways higher education's trump card, if you'll forgive the expression. This is our ace in the hole. This is what we can say to people. That no matter how scary you think higher education is, for whatever reason, or how anxious you are about it, it's worth it. Now, there are problems with this. Because this is really the average. So off the top of that are thoracic surgeons and geological engineers. Now the bother English PhDs. Um, <laughs> but we have this to account for. Now, this might not work anymore. This is historical. And it might not play out in the future. But this is many ways we have to cling to. Now, the third thing, and then I'll stop, is what automation is. If you think about this in the big picture type of play. This is a tweet I keep coming back to again and again. Uh, in the long run, I think we will evolve in computing from mobile first to an AI first world. So I mentioned we're designing for mobile first, and education isn't quite there yet. So think of designing for AI first. You may experience this if you use Alexa or if you heavily use Siri or any of them. What's Microsoft's tool called again? I mean, if you use up all of these tools, you get a sense of what it's like to have an AI first world. Imagine education looks like that. We're still figuring out what that can be. So, one thing to think about is if we have widespread underemployment as a result of technological revolutions, what's the function of higher ed? It is part of your function to guarantee full employment for graduates in the face of a really, really hard economy. Or is it also to give them something to do when they're not employed? I don't think this is, I don't think facetious. The life well lived, the full well lived life, is that more of our job? We have to think about what this could be. Or if we have more of a cyborg future, I don't mean implants necessarily. I mean just working more and more closely with technology. Imagine a kid who goes to high school who has a dumb AI as their assistant, who tracks their performance in class, who gives them nudges for quizzes who helps them out when they're thinking about assignments, when they're watching a movie as a foreign language bit, nudges them and says, by the way, that was Spanish, you should practice that, that kind of thing. That student then goes to college, and then the, the college AI is smarter. It helps them think about their curriculum, and it helps them advise their way through pathways through college. That person then graduates, maybe they write an article for a law review journal, and the AI helps them with bibliographic assignments. Is that what education is about then? Are we helping students with that intimate relationship with that close AI? Does that change our pedagogy? Yeah, we have to. Do we outsource more of this to apps? For example, I'm using the Duolingo language learning program right now. And right now, it's about as good as a 101 language class that I would generically get. If you drop me somewhere randomly in the US, take Spanish 101, that's what, what I have right now. Right now. Five years from now, do we outsource Spanish to Duolingo 9.0? That's an option. But here's the other one. <laughs> I want you to think about this very carefully. I mentioned self-driving cars that are better than us right now. And they're going to get better, but we're not. Uh, think about uh, speech transcription. Microsoft has a team that does better speech transcription than humans do. So if you play audio tape, they'll come with better text result than humans. We have other technology that can read your eyeballs and your skin looking for pupil and capillary dilation, which we can then translate into moods. At some point, we'll have software and hardware that can read human emotional states. How are we going to deal with living in a world where the technology is just better than us? Popular culture has all kinds of ways of thinking about it. Arnold Schwarzenegger is one way, right? We have lots of science fiction that just think about it, but not academia. You think about the field represented in a catalog. You think about the law, you think of poli sci, psychology, philosophy, religion. In many ways, I can use a place to help us think what happens next. This is what happens next for me, though. This is our side. Uh, I come from a, a small state that's very low tech. Uh, we're not sure about you know, new technology, cable TV. Actually, I think we're on cable TV. Cable TV. This is a bunch of high school students and one middle school kid. We had a contest in the state. They had to go to their local community and 
find a historical building. Read up on the building. Primary source material, secondary source material. Then build a 3D image of it, and then print it out. And that's one of the judges for a contest. So these kids came from all over the state. So it's great kind of map of the state, like the size of half this room. And they had these little printouts placed in different parts. You walk around and like Godzilla. Oh, look at that there. And I talked to all these kids. And just look how cool they are. <laughs> oh, yeah, 3D printing, sure. Talked to one kid who spent a day modeling a house stone walls. He couldn't get the texture just right, so he did. Talked to another kid who built three versions of the same building, so you could take them apart over time, so you could see how it changed over a century. I think about these kids. I mean, these are the kids who are going to go to college. I think, are we ready for that? I think when they were kids, when they were much younger, we broke the global economy, and we started globally warming the world faster and faster, doing with our eyes wide open. And then we hate these kids, too. We blame them for not making the economy grow. We blame them for being entitled. We blame them for being trophy kids. I think about these kids every day and wonder how we can evolve to respond to them. Now, every PowerPoint presentation ends with URLs according to federal law. <laughs> um, so if you want to find out more stuff about me, blah, 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 blah. Um, do we have time for questions, or do I have to release them to the bathroom? A couple of minutes, please. I, I, I talk too much. I would love to hear your thoughts. Go back first. All those trends. Which of them hits you the most? Which of them gets you the most interested or the most terrified and most excited? I'm a recovering English professor, so I'll call on you if you don't say anything. <laughs> and you missed almost everything. I, have to ask I know, you. but I really like the end. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's usually a good sign. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know, uh, sort of like, <coughs> is, there, is there such a thing as a post human? environment and, you know, uh, what is, if you're thinking about education, you can also find parallels going back in many different points in history where technology sort of out, outstrips biology. Yes. Um, yes. You know, in the early 80s, being able, mm -hmm. or even if you, if you go back to being able to treat disease with penicillin, I mean, there, you know, we've always had technology that's ahead because that's what we do this progress and education has a role to help people to discern you know what is sort of the our relationship to our, our own sense of, of, of progress and, and innovation and I think education always comes in there to help that discernment process. Well, first of all, can I clone you? Uh, if you have the technology. I'll, I'll work you out. The 3D printing is coming. The scanner is the hard part, but what do you do here? Uh, I actually fundraise for the Excellent. Good for you. Good for you. We need more of you. Um, everywhere. Uh, this, is a, this is a huge oh thing. I mean, you go back to the uh, 1880s, 1890s, when the gramophone started to appear, and people get freaked out because you can hear the voices of the dead. For real. And now we're kind of used to that. Right? It's a no, no big deal, but you know how shocking that was. Or the telegraph, the telephone, you leave the voice of someone invisible, alive. It's just dizzying stuff. Well, freaked out. Education is there. There are ways to respond to that. Uh, and we've done this with all kinds of technologies. Well, I mentioned human lifespan briefly earlier on. That's another way we have to think about this as we get older and older. I mean, not individually, but all of them, but as society ages out, how do we respond? There are schools across the U.S. that are experimenting with senior only programs. Maybe this is a way forward for those. Thank you. I'm glad you can. Yes, please. I think we're so about thinking in technology, when you're really thinking about the future, I think a lot of the questions you raise are so relevant, but I think there's also unintended consequences of everything that you talked about. There's also, I think, maybe more important for education to think about, the role of PhDs and faculty are changing. The social emotional well-being that students come through having experience a life of technology means that we're going to need to support them differently than we are now. Yes. And I'm wondering if you, what your thoughts about that are, and you know, well, the first question is, who are you? What do you do here? I'm Jane Sturry. I'm the dean of the School of Dean Studies. Oh, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for letting me in your campus. Um, that's a terrific question. Uh, unintended consequences are just so, so vast right now. We have, I've had a chance to dive into some of them. For example, a uh, great science fiction writer once said, it's easy to predict a car. It's hard to predict traffic jams. Um, so along those lines, I keep coming back to you. Sorry. There's a, 
uh, Los Angeles Architecture Firm had a contest this year, trying to think about what happens to American spaces if we have fewer cars. Because if we combine self-driving cars with Uber, Lyft style of ride sharing, we think about a car does nothing 95% of the time. But what if we can simply reduce the total number of cars in North American streets? What happens to spaces? So we've built out wider and wider roads. We've built more parking garages and parking spaces. Never enough. Well, what if it's too much? What happens to empty parking garages? And so there's, there's a contest to repurpose them. You know, they become major spaces, they become housing, they become medical places, which are really unintended consequences right there for the star. Right? And when it comes to technology, well, again, tell me your name, I'm sorry. Uh, Lisa. Lisa. But you're talking about the, the high value academia. This is, in part, we have the ability to study this. In the business sector, we often don't because we have really tight schedules, looking at the next quarter, that kind of thing. But we can see a lot more think about this or really bad. When it comes to the role of faculty, something that I didn't think to talk about, one of the things that happened over the past 30 years is academia decided in the US that we're going to reduce tenure traffic. And we went from having the majority of faculty who were mostly tenure track to that being a minority. And we've continued that process. We haven't slowed it down at all. Uh, and there's no public support for increasing tenure anywhere in any state. It's fascinating to see. So we now have a majority of faculty being actually across the US. And it depends on where you are geographically by sector, we've done that. And that's a huge shift. And that's some of interesting shifts in Russ's job, because everyone knows you, right? Russ? Um, most, yes. OK, tell us your title again. Uh, Director of Instructional Support and Learning Innovation for the School of Consumer Studies. OK, got that? OK. And you raise funds for it, and you explain this to everybody else. <laughs> so one of, the, one of the reasons I'm picking on him is because the educational technology, instructional design strategy has changed. It used to be that it was to support tenured faculty, because tenured faculty would be there for a long time, and they're politically important. Well, they're a small portion, depending on different campuses and where you are. So now, should educational designers shift towards supporting adjunct faculty instead? For example, that's an interesting shift. But I don't think it's something, I think, a little bit different. Like, so I think that and that if you think about who's going to be showing up on campus, not just in terms of their demographic, but in their cognition and their social emotional health, mm -hmm. the way that we train PhD or folks to teach is going to be different because cognition is different. And so we have to start thinking about in the academy structurally, right, how we train at every single level, from undergrad to grad to, to uh, faculty. So that's what I'm talking about. Like, how does higher ed start to change differently, not just for those at the undergraduate level, but those who are the graduate level? Because those who are going to be in the classroom are going to need a different set of skills, not just the content, disciplinary experts, leaders of the field. Yep. Because I believe teaching and learning is going to look profoundly different. I, I don't know where those conversations are going to be. Those conversations are happening very, very slowly, and we're changing very slowly and not very well. Um, and so you think about something like as simple as, say, uh, flip classroom as a <coughs> We are training people in that in white numbers. That's often DIY kind of thing. Or you can put discussion questions. I mean, if, if we push lectures out of classrooms and have more Q&A role playing than, than discussion, but that's fantastic. You gotta train people in that. They're, I mean, I, as a teacher, uh, I have in mind, as one of my practices, several great professors. Uh, so several terrible professors, great people, but who ask the worst possible question I've ever seen. It's like the, Few uh, industry science theater level of questions, um, and that would help me as I went. But in many ways, they don't have the training for this, so we really have to rethink that. Much less when we get to more advanced technologies. So if we're going to be training, how do we train faculty to use VR in classrooms? How do we teach faculty to teach students who live in a campus that's completely networked in internet of things? Much less through something like augmented reality or artificial intelligence. We have to be thinking about this, and I think K twelve training is ahead of. Training. And also the relationship between uh, teachers and faculty, because as we move towards a much more durable model, which I don't think is going anywhere, I think it's completely expanding and it's going to be the norm here. It's going to teach. Which model? Dual enrollment, where you have yes. more high school students graduating with yeah. associate's degrees as well as a high school diploma. Yeah. That begs the question what is the relationship between high school teachers and faculty? Which and how do we think about scaffolding level work across K 12 and across higher ed? Which I think will be much more more lines than there are now. California is a good place to see that. Yeah. Uh, the California State University system is moving really, really closely with high schools. Uh, in, in California, the CSU system is very, very rigidly focused. 
Uh, so every CSU tends to work really closely with, say, 100 miles of mile radius. And they work very closely with, uh, with high schools. One reason for that is enrollment, because the closer you can work with, with high schools, you can generate more enrollment. Uh, I talked to Wesleyan University's uh, president, who, this is funny, uh, he joined EDX and created MOOC, and then he told his faculty about it afterwards. Interesting time. Mm -hmm. his, I think his main reason for doing this was to reach high school students. And he described it in a way that was very positive. It was clearly, it was, it was marketing. It was to tell people about how this could work. So that kind of dual enrollment <coughs> built it together. The problem is, that's a horrible barrier to cross. Faculty you know, called post-secondary and the emphasis on the post, that's a very, very tough barrier to cross. Um, so I, I think that's something that, I think I look at the CSU system for doing really great progress on that. Soon we might be making progress on that, individual schools uh, in New York State. Um, but they have a terrible demographic problem uh, of just hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging kids. So that's a, it's almost like we're evolving into a high touch cycle. Thank you. Uh, behind you, you had a question before. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Ellen. Uh, in your discussion, one thing I, I picked up was that uh, you very much really mentioned anything about leadership, how that will impact what we as educators as we move forward. I was wondering perhaps if you could share a little bit about yeah. that ingredient in the whole mix of the future. Tell me what you do first. I'm an instructor. Uh, oh, fantastic, fantastic. I was at uh, two different campuses in Texas talking to faculty who were falling over themselves saying they couldn't do anything without their instructional designers. Like, ah, that's very, very good. Um, good people. Um, leadership is crucial. And it depends on what we're talking about. So, on the campus level, um, there, depending on the scale, uh, we have decisive interventions happening in part at the provost level. Uh, because the provost is the head of the academic mission in college, and their decisions really, I think, are the most powerful of shaping everything else. Presidents rarely need to be at that level. Um, and below the provost level, depending on the size of campus, if the head of a school or the head of a program or department has a lot of local power, but really the CAO level is, is crucial for that. The head of uh, the CIO, depending on, on the title, VP, what's, what's your formal title right now? So the CIO, literally the CIO in this case, can make or break a technological deployment. So if they're brilliant and forward thinking like this gentleman is, I'm putting you on the spot there, <laughs> um, that makes a huge, huge difference. Another key part of leadership is to put somebody else on the spot, the head of libraries because the libraries have so much resource, so much capacity to really get involved, really integrate, and that head of libraries can stop that from happening to them, or throw it into overdrive. Uh, beyond that, if you're a private institution, it depends on the role of your governance structure. Your, your board or your other, whichever entity is in charge, can really nudge things in strong ways, and often end up giving the provost a lot of marching orders that not every faculty member will be aware of necessarily. That's a really important conversation to have. I work with a lot of boards, and they're fantastic to talk to because they're so diverse. That's another. The public sector, then we enter the state area. And the state area is wild right now. Uh, I was at the uh, Midwestern Higher Education Consortium Conference, which was really interesting. Because half of them were academic leaders. They're half were state government leaders. So governors, uh, committee leaders, and state legislatures. And the latter group hated tuition increases completely. One governor stood and said, yeah, we have a tuition-free statewide standing deviation. I mean, they're really intense about this. But they also don't necessarily know a lot about higher education. And then they respond weirdly politically. But are you following, for example, the New York State um, Excelsior Scholarship? Yeah, that's a really, my analysis is that's Governor Cuomo aiming for the 2020 Democratic presidential ticket um, in a really interesting way. I don't think it's controversial to say. Um, but that has already run roughshod over half of higher education in New York State. So for example, it's clobbering the private sector, it's clobbering community colleges, um, which is interesting to see. That leadership really, really makes a big difference. The company, I'm sorry, tell me your name again. Kevin O'Rourke. The, the one in front of you? Oh, Scurry. Thank you, when, when, you're, when you're talking about the importance of training faculty, leadership needs to be trained in this stuff as well. You need to go to Russ and learn that the technologies are coming out. And they need to be aware of all the implications, all the different ways they intersect with each other. That's a very, very long-winded answer to your very elegant questions. I hope it helps a bit.
I tend to wait for someone to raise it before I shake myself. We're out of time. Yeah. Dr. Hayden, how you doing? It's been great. I think uh, we've probably talked all day. <laughs> and we will. It's been, it's been fantastic. And what a great way to start the morning. <laughs> Microsoft and here from um, Microsoft. 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 Microsoft.